Welcome to PwC IFRS Talks, your source for all things IFRS. I'm your host, Rahaza Sheikh. In today's podcast, we'll be providing an overview of the November IFRS Interpretations Committee, so that's the IFRIC Committee. To talk us through the developments, I'd like to welcome my return guest, Kharsten Gansari. Welcome back, Kharsten. Glad to be back, Rahaza. This month, the agenda was I would say relatively short consisting of new items and the first item was on a new submission about how to assess whether a contract contains a lease applying IFRS 16 in particular when the supplier has particular substitution rights. Carsten can you summarize the background of this submission? Sure so this submission relates to the definition of a lease that is whether a lease exists in a particular type of arrangement now, this may so sound like a simple question, and in many cases it is, but in some cases, this can actually be quite a complex analysis. IFRS 16 contains specific guidance around when a contract contains a lease and describes in quite a bit of detail the respective criteria for determining whether a lease exists in a particular contract. As a reminder, IFRS 16 defines a lease as a contract that conveys the right to use an asset for a period of time in exchange for consideration. That is, the customer must have the right to use an asset. So one of the conditions for lease is that a particular asset can be identified, which is referred to in IFRS 16 as the underlying asset or identified asset. And so if an underlying asset as described in IFRS 16 cannot be identified, then there is no lease. So this submission asks whether an identified asset and therefore a lease exists in a particular fact pattern. One example where these kind of questions arise is in relation to batteries in, in electric vehicles. In these cases, entities may enter into a contract with a supplier to equip electric vehicles with batteries. Now, these batteries may be replaced by the supplier on some regular basis. So the frequency of these replacements may vary depending on the economic benefits for the supplier that's associated with the replacement at a particular point in time. Now, in the example provided in the submission, the contract term with the supplier is for 10 years, and it is assumed that the supplier has the practical ability to substitute the batteries throughout the period of use, and also that he would benefit from sub such substitution at some point during the contract term. However, the complexity in the submitted fact pattern is that the replacement is only going to be economically beneficial for the supplier at particular points in time. The example in the submission assumes that it would be economically beneficial for the supplier to substitute the battery at some point, but it that it would not be beneficial for him to replace the batteries in the first three years of the contract. So can you expand on the accounting question that was asked in the submission? Yeah, so this, the submitter asks two questions in this regard. Let's maybe focus on the first question for now, which was much more controversial than the second question. The first question in the submission focuses on paragraph B14 of IFRS 16, which states that a customer does not have the right to use an identified asset if the supplier has a substantive right to substitute the asset throughout the period of use. That paragraph then goes on and lists two criteria that need to be met in order to conclude that a substitution right is substantive. Now, a lot of the debate focused around whether both of these criteria have to be met throughout the period of use and what the term throughout the period of use really means, including whether throughout the period of use might mean that these conditions must be met at every point in time during the contract term. And on this first question, what were the committee's views on the issue? So overall, all committee members seem to agree that it would seem highly likely that the customer would conclude that there is a lease in this kind of fact pattern. However, there was quite a bit of discussion around the exact reasoning for this conclusion. Also, many were concerned about specific aspects of the analysis and also about potential unintended consequences for other similar fact patterns. Because of this, many felt that the exact wording of the agenda decision would be critical. Now, there are a couple of other paragraphs in IFRS 16 that are relevant in assessing whether there's a lease in this kind of fact pattern. For example, paragraph B17 of IFRS 16 indicates that if the asset is located at the customer's premises, 
which is the case in this fact pattern, that it is less likely that there would be a substantive substitution right, and thus more likely that there would be a lease. Also, paragraph B19 of Article 16 states that if the customer cannot readily determine whether the supplier has a substantive substitution right, he shall presume that any substitution right is not substantive. That is quite a high hurdle. So in practice, I think it's likely that customers would need to rely on this presumption. In addition, many committee members felt that in practice, it would be unlikely that the supplier would even have the practical ability to substitute the assets of the period of use. So many committee members felt that this was perhaps a bit of a theoretical debate, since customers would already, based on these other paragraphs, likely conclude that there is a lease in the kind of fact pattern illustrated in the submission. However, the facts in the submission assume that all these other requirements do not lead to a conclusion that there is a lease and focus solely on paragraph B14B of IFRS 16, assuming that the supplier does benefit economically from substitution, but is only expected to benefit from that substitution at particular points in time during the contract term. Now, the, the analysis in the staff paper stated that in this fact pattern, where substitution is only going to be economically beneficial at particular points in time, after three years in the example, means that even though the substitution right may be substantive, it does not exist throughout the period of use. And so that paragraph B14 in IFRS 16 would also lead to the conclusion that there is a lease in this particular fact pattern. There was quite an intense debate around, around that, including what is meant by the term throughout the period of use. Personally, I, I was quite worried this could be read to mean at any point in time during the contract term. So if you take this to the extreme, one might think that substitution must be economically beneficial, say, on every single day of the contract. However, after some debate, committee members acknowledged that this is not necessarily the case and that judgment would be involved in determining whether a supplier's right to substitute is substantive throughout the period of use. So, the tentative agenda decision does not go into much detail on this point, but my sense is that it means that depending on the exact facts, a supplier's right to substitute might be substantive throughout the period of use, even if it's not economically beneficial to substitute the underlying asset at every point in time during the contract term. I think this is actually quite an important point to avoid unintended consequences for other fact patterns where substitution might occur on a, on a more frequent basis as, as it is the case in the submitted fact pattern. So essentially, the committee concluded that in the specific fact pattern submitted, there would be a lease. However, my sense is that this conclusion was limited to the specific facts where substitution would only be beneficial after quite a substantial time, and it would not necessarily apply to other circumstances where substitution occurs within a substantially shorter time period or on a more frequent basis. So I, I think it's important to highlight that the tentative agenda decision acknowledges that there's judgment involved in determining whether a supplier's right to substitute is substantive throughout the period of use. And therefore, depending on the exact facts, the conclusion might be different for other fact patterns where substitution is economically beneficial for the supplier, you know, within a shorter time period or on a more frequent basis. Thanks, Carson. I think it's really helpful to understand um, where the particular judgments lie and, you know, what makes the conclusion different in this particular fact pattern. That's very helpful. So you mentioned that there were two questions that were submitted. Can you expand on the second question of the submission? Sure. So, so the second question asked when the, you know, when the contract is for the use of multiple similar assets, at what level to evaluate whether a contract contains a lease? That is, by considering each asset separately or all assets together. For background, the fact pattern in the submission used an example just to describe the issue and identify two possible views. So let's assume a customer enters into a contract with a supplier for the right to use 100 similar assets, and it is expected that the supplier will substitute 20 out of those 100 assets on the basis that the supplier will benefit economically from substitution for those 20 assets. And let's further assume that the probability of substitution for each asset has the same probability, that is 20%. The submission stated two possible views in this regard. So the first view was essentially 
you know, that since the probability of substitution is only 20% for each individual asset, this means that there is a lease for all of the 100, 100 underlying assets. And, and the second view was that an entity could apply, you know, some kind of port portfolio approach. And so when considered as a whole, 20 assets are likely going to be substituted. And so right of use assets and lease liabilities would only be recognized for 80 of those assets. Now, on this one, there, there really was almost no debate at all. Committee members quite unanimously supported the first view. That is that the customer assesses whether the contract contains a lease for each potential separate lease component that is, you know, separately for each battery. Thanks, Carsten. I guess in, in this scenario, the tentative agenda decision, we expect that will be soon available to comment on. And usually the comment period is 60 days. Correct me if I'm wrong, Carsten. That's right. But Perfect. And we'll include a link to the, the relevant page on the IFS website um, where you can submit comments and that will be within the talking points that accompany this podcast, which are available on Viewpoint. So moving on to the next agenda item then. Uh, the committee discussed potential annual improvements to IFS accounting standards. Before we go into the discussion, Carsten, can you perhaps explain what the IFRIX role is when it comes to potential annual improvements? Sure. So I think the IFRIX is well known as the interpret interpretative body of the ISB, which mainly includes dealing with submissions in some way, most, most commonly via an agenda decision. However, the committee also supports the ISB more broadly in terms of consistent application of IFRS and also does other work at the request of the ISB. For annual improvements, the objective of bringing those to the IFRIC is to get input from committee members around the issues that have been identified as potential annual improvements, so that this can be considered by the staff before the issue is brought to the board. Maybe before we dive into this, you know, for background, let me briefly remind folks what kind of issues are addressed by the board via annual improvements. Now, those are intended to address minor or narrow scope amendments that don't require separate exposure and stakeholder input for each of these proposals. Because these amendments are considered to be sufficiently minor or narrow in scope, they would be packaged together and exposed in a single document, even though those amendments may be completely unrelated to each other. So those annual improvements would follow the same due process as other amendments to IFRS, except that they consist of several re relatively minor and typically unrelated amendments that are exposed together in a single package. As an alternative, the ISB staff can also consider to make e editorial corrections to remedy minor drafting errors. But these would normally just fix, you know, spelling or grammatical errors or incorrectly marked consequential amendments. So as soon as any proposed changes go beyond what is considered purely edi editorial, they need to be addressed via some sort of standard setting to comply with the due process handbook. So when potential amendments to the, to the words are considered, depending on the type of change, it needs to be considered whether that amendment can be dealt with by a simple editorial correction or should be dealt with via a more formal standard setting process, which could either be an annual improvement if the amendment is considered relatively minor, or it could be dealt with via a separate exposure draft if it is considered slightly more significant. Essentially, the intention of bringing potential annual improvements to the interpretations committee is to tap on the practical experience of committee members and ask for their views on those potential improvements, including whether the proposals appropriately address the identified issue, whether there are any related issues that, that should be considered, and whether there might be any unintended consequences of the proposed amendments. And also to get a sense whether committee members agree that an annual improvement is the, is the right way to deal with the issue, or whether they should be addressed in other ways instead, such, you know, such as a simple editorial correction, or if considered more significant, via a separate standard, standard setting project. Thanks, Carsten. That's a, a really helpful overview of the IFRIC's role in potential annual improvements. This agenda item actually consisted of six papers which resulted in you know, proposed amendments to IFRS 1, IFRS 10, IFRS 9, IFRS 7 and IS 7. So a couple of standards impacted there. And as you mentioned, predominantly these were clarifications to the standard to avoid 
potential confusion, particularly across different standards. So I don't suggest we go into each paper in detail, but perhaps we can discuss maybe what might be the most controversial improvement. And in my view, that would be the amendment to IFRS 10. Would, would you agree, Carsten? Well, well, yes, I, I agree that that one probably was the bit was a bit more fundamental than some of the other proposed amendments, and certainly triggered the most substantial discussion. Sure. Would you be able to perhaps begin with a summary of the matter? Sure. So, so in the interest of time, I suggest we don't go into much detail. But on a, on a high level, this proposed annual improvement was around the guidance in IFRS 10 on de facto agents. So let's, let me illustrate the issue with a simple example. Assume two entities, A and B, are under the control of one shareholder. Now, further assume that both A and B hold shares in another entity, C. Uh, further assume that both of these shareholdings do not give either A or B control over C on a standalone basis, but taken together, they do give control, which is, you know, which is why the common shareholder of A and B also has control of C. So assuming both entities, A and B, prepare IFRS consolidated financial statements, the issue really was whether and under which circumstances A or B might be de facto agents acting on behalf of the other party. And what was the staff's proposal on this issue? Now, essentially, that improvement was aiming to clarify that either A might be a de facto, de facto agent of B or B might be a de facto agent of A. But it's not possible that both A would be a de facto agent of B and at the same time, B would also be a de facto agent of A. I don't think people have generally re read the current guidance in that way, but the wording in paragraph B74 of IFRS 10 was slightly confusing. So the staff was proposing to clarify the wording in that respect. And what was the committee's views on this issue? Now, now, even though all committee members seem to agree with that intention, so that not both A and B could be a de facto agent of each other at the same time, there was quite a bit of concern that the wording changes proposed by the staff to IFRS 10 in that regard might not be limited to what the staff was aiming at. It might have broader consequences. Because of this, some committee members suggested that this was that this should not go ahead as proposed and recommended either that the wording should be adjusted to avoid that potential for broader implications, or alternatively, this should be dealt with via a separate standard setting activity. I think this is a good example where the committee's input is probably quite helpful in terms of, of assessing the implications and also in terms of assessing whether an annual improvement is the right way to deal with the issue. Thanks, Carson. So perhaps more to come on that in the future. <laughs> so the remaining agenda item that was discussed was on the post-implementation review of IFRS 15. And the purpose of this item was to obtain some initial views from the committee members on the implementation and ongoing application of IFRS 15, including an initial view on matters that the ISB should consider as part of the post-implementation review. There'll be more to come in the first half of 2023, which is when we expect the request for information to be made. So that brings us to the wrap up of the podcast. I'd like to thank you for joining me today, Carsten. I understand that the, the next IFRIC meeting in January has actually been cancelled and that there are some possible issues in the pipeline which may come to a future IFRIC meeting. I look forward to seeing how the pipeline issues and those that we discussed today will develop at the next IFRIC update that I expect will be in March. Thanks, Raya. I look forward to speaking to you again soon. And finally, a big thank you to all our listeners. I hope you found it useful. And until next time, happy accounting. The preceding program was brought to you by PricewaterhouseCoopers LLP. This content is for general information purposes and is not a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.